Hey there, welcome to the Snakebird Podcast. My name's Josh. And I'm Steve. Together we invite you to join us as we explore the mysteries of Scripture, the realm of God, and freedom through Christ. So spread out your wings and slither in place because this is Snakebird. Snake hey, welcome Snakebirds to another episode of the Snakebird Podcast. We're picking up today right where we left off last time asking, when does it become a sin? Right, Steve? That's right. We're discussing where it makes that turn into a vice. So hang on, and we're going to pick up right where we left off. No no exception is, is food here. This is mm-hmm. another one. Um, some have heard this uh, called gluttony, and we see that word in the Bible. And I always thought um, gluttony was a word that described excessive eating exclusively, but what I found was, while gluttony does describe somebody, we can physically see that problem, uh, the word actually describes a deeper condition in the heart, I found. It was really interesting. The Hebrew word for gluttony, translated appetite in many versions, is nefesh. And it actually defines um, a soul, living being, life, self, person, desire, passion, appetite, and emotion. So... That's not speaking primarily of food there, which was really surprising to me. Mm -hmm. Um, The idea in this word is to excessively seek pleasure. So this is not just speaking um, of overeating, although it does include overeating. However, the Greek word for gluttony is phagos, which speaks of only eating. Even at its root meaning through the Greek word estheo, its usage defines as I eat, partake of food, I devour, I consume as rust does, mm. which um, in every uh, instance I saw it in the New Testament, it was only a food. So, And the idea of rust is like cancer, so it eats away, no pun intended, at the host. So a very unhealthy eating. Um, but every time we see the word gluttony in the New Testament, it's, it's talking about diet. But the idea in both old and new is the pursuit for pleasure. And so that that is definitely a vice. The Pharisees use this word to describe Jesus as a sinner in pursuit of pleasure in Matthew eleven nine. we see. Oh, eleven nineteen rather. Um, so what does this sinful pursuit of pleasure really look like? Um, this is important because we definitely don't want to send anybody away with the idea that we should uh, feel guilty for having joy and pleasure in this life because there's a lot of healthy pleasures that we can have in the here and now. But I think it's um, it's interesting to look at a biblical um, look at, at what sinful pleasure, a.k.a. gluttony, is. Mm-hmm. And I, I spent a little time. I wasn't planning on spending any time on this like I did, but it was such a fascinating um a study. So Proverbs 6, 6 through 11 says this, Go to the ant, you sluggard, consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores up its provisions in summer and gathers food at harvest. That was my proof text for prepping. But back to the verse 9, How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. And poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. So this verse shows us, or these verses show us a pretty clear picture of what the heart of a glutton looks like. Um, Someone whose pleasure is found in rest, laziness, being apathetic and providing for themselves. Uh, I think the comparable state of mind today would be someone who spends more time um, entertaining themselves than being productive and intentional with their time. And I see this rampant in our country today. Many have been born into like a mindset of dependency. And I've been in full-time construction for close to 20 years now. And every year, it is so hard to find hardworking applicants for even that type of job. Um, the common denominator in almost every case is this gluttonous priority of pleasure over priority. And I've seen... Um, I've seen it with the high class and low class. Privilege is a word that we hear a lot these days, but privilege is more of a mindset problem than a socioeconomic problem. And Proverbs 6 um, is a great descriptor for what I see today, this vice of pursuit of pleasure over um you know, the healthy way to go about it. Mm-hmm. So like, it, I just found it fascinating because I always just assume it was just about eating. And in the New Testament, it is. But it's also uh, inclusive of, the, of this idea of, of just seeking pleasure. Yeah. So that, I found it fascinating. Yeah. And I mean, I've heard it a lot of ways because, you know, you have, do we eat to live or do we live to eat? Yeah. You know, and there are some people who are just like, I just 
want to consume, you know, and, yeah. and, um, it's sad because it is the society. I was thinking of what's that Will Ferrell movie where he lives in the basement and he's just like me loaf, you know, <laughs> he just, you know, everything's about like, what's, you know, what's the next video game that he's going to play or what's the next meal. And, um, I believe that I've heard, and I didn't get a fact check on this, but I believe that I heard the word was even associated with Romans who would, um, the glutton word would even fill up as much as they could eat and of really good food. I was trying to think of delicacies. They would go and they would throw up so that they had room to eat some more. Oh, wow. And that's nasty. (laughs) But that was all about the pleasure of the experience of eating. Yeah. And so that's one of those that I'll have to research more. So don't hold me uh, to that. (laughs) But if I recall, there's somewhere in the recesses of my brain that that happened. Yes. And that, and that's a thing, you know, I mean, obviously food is is good for us. We would die without it. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, that is something that I even struggle with. You know, I've, I've got a belly on me Mm -hmm. and I, uh, it's something that, that we all got in all of these things, smoking, you know, the thing about sin is it all separates us from God and we all got to determine these lines where it becomes sin. And, um, is it affecting me in Mm -hmm. a serious way? Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's it was a fascinating look at, at gluttony. Yeah, and I was thinking of a couple of different verses that talk about like just enjoying uh, your food. Yeah, Ecclesiastes five eighteen says, as Solomon is kind of writing his research paper on the purpose of life, he says, "Here's what I've seen: it is good and fitting for one to eat and drink, to enjoy the good of his labor, which he toils under the sun all the days of his life, which God gives him, for it is his heritage." And I really like the picture that he paints there of just a guy outside just grilling his food, you know, and he's sitting in his backyard and he's looking at what he's provided for his family. And he goes, this is awesome. Yeah. You know, or um, even Nehemiah, where they had the reading of the law and everybody was so convicted about how they'd sinned and (laughs) they started crying. And Nehemiah looks at him and he goes, no, no, today is a day of rejoicing. The joy of our Lord is our strength. And he says, go your way and eat the fat and drink the sweet. And he says, just rejoice in who God is and how he allowed us to find this book of the law that we could correct our our uh lifestyles yes and 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 that was a celebration mm -hmm. it was like we we don't do this every night yes it was a celebration and it's okay to to i don't know if indulge is the right word or not but kind of maybe it's okay to every now and then just celebrate yes and, and, and and enjoy some of these things yeah as long as you don't make a habit of it but yeah um, you want to be in, in an excessive way. Yeah. Well, I was thinking of the converse aspect of this where in speaking about the enemies of the cross, this is what Paul said. He said they are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things and they only think about life here on this earth. And I, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> what's the thing they say that you're, you know, you're fat when you think about what you're going to eat next while you're having that current <laughs> meal. <laughs> You know, I hadn't heard that one. Oh, and that's a, <laughs> that's a, a good chuckle. <laughs> that's a sketchy thing. Yeah. You know, because again, our meals should be for fuel. And I understand I'm, I'm overweight for, for real. And, uh, the thing is, is like, is that something I want to stay in? No. Do I want to be effective for God on this, on this planet while I'm alive? Yes. But I also realize that other people have genetic conditions or they have, you know, disabilities or they have multiple obstacles in their path to getting where they want to be. Now they have to look at it through this spiritual lens going, am I eating for pleasure? Because I know of people and I've done it before in my in my past of I am eating to fill a hole. I am eating to fulfill my life. And that is a scary place to be. And that's where that conscience comes in of going, why am I doing what I'm doing? Yeah. And every every single one of us guys, we all lean towards a particular sin. Mm-hmm. And so all the, the thing about sin is no matter what it is, it separates us from God. Yeah. And so what, whatever this leaning is, man, we got to, we got to keep an eye on it and uh, we're all struggling with something yeah and i didn't even write down the chapter and verse for this but i found the verse that says put on the lord jesus christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires yeah you know at times if we want to get to where we we want to be sometimes it's a salad 
and not a pizza. Sometimes it's a, you know, frozen yogurt and not ice cream, or sometimes it's, you know. I heard one preacher say once that uh, a lot of times we'll make a, a real hard stance. We'll be like, get away from me, Satan, but we'll leave him our mailing address <laughs> so that, you know, when yeah. I think of provisions for the flesh, it's yeah. like it's like I'm making this stance. But somewhere in you, you're making another subtle decision to leave a back door. Oh, yeah. You know. Yeah. So, yeah, that's the, the tricky mind we have. <laughs> what, is it the, um, the guy who stood up and prayed or the pastor who stood up and prayed, God, remove the cobwebs of sin from my life. Do you remember that story? <laughs> Lord, remove the spider. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. The guy kept praying for the cobwebs to get up. And finally, an older, wiser man got up at one point after so many weeks of the pastor saying, remove the cobwebs of sin. And finally, this old, wiser man got up and goes, kill the spider. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I mean, that's, that's what it is. Find the root and get that out because in some of our hearts, maybe it's image, you know, maybe we struggle with our image or maybe we struggle yes. with who God made us to be. And you had sent me a link the other day about people who hate themselves or, or finding their identity in the society that focuses on how we look or if we're overweight, how much we're judged. And the guy yeah. was like, it's, it's amazing how much overweight people are judged. They're judged more than anyone else in society right now. Yeah. And he says, and a lot of people that look at them don't even know the circumstances of why they're overweight Yeah, or if they are who God made them to be. And it's hard for someone who can be overweight to own their own body type, you know, and, and it's not something that they necessarily probably want to have, but they can't lean into gluttony and they can't lean into the self-gratification of it all and just give up. Yeah. And, you know, the thing about the, some of this stuff is people love to categorize and say this is worse than that. And people are easy targets who, who have a um, you can see their sin. Mm-hmm. And so not not that I would um, justify a sin uh, of being overweight, but, you know, people, they have hidden sins. And sometimes the hidden sins of the heart are way more uh, deadly than the ones that you can see in someone else. So the, a lot of times it'll be an easy target for us to, everybody can kind of see that somebody is is involved with something or whatever. And not that there needs to be justification for that either, but um, we can see that and we're like, hey, look, everybody can see this. Let's point the finger when the truth is the sin of the heart can be much more serious of a condition. Yeah. Um, as we were preparing for this, I found this verse in First Timothy uh, chapter 5, verse 24. It says, Remember the sins of some people are obvious, leading them to certain judgment, but there are others whose sins will not be revealed until later. And so we talk about how maybe the sin is like an iceberg where you see you know, 10% of it above the surface and then the 90% is below. Yeah. Whereas there might also be the people that are just completely, their sin is obvious. 90% yeah. is above and only 10% is below. But no matter what, sin is sin and it yeah. still has to be dealt with. It still has to be repented from. Yes, exactly. I almost prefer to to deal with the ones of uh, what you see is what you get. Yeah. Because at least you know what you're dealing with. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> the hidden vindictiveness and all of that stuff is a lot harder to deal no, with. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Usually that's pretty dark. Yeah, for yeah. real. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's all I got on, on, you know, food and gluttony. Um, and I, I have one more category that's specific that I have. Josh, is there any ones you want to go into right now? Yeah, I have a couple quick ones. Okay. Um, so drugs, you yeah. know, drugs I mean, are bad. <laughs> Don't do crack. Yeah. There's never a good instance to do some things. No. Yeah. Um, So you have legal drugs. And I want to say that, you know, before it becomes a vice is when you use it within guidelines, uh, the given guidelines and within reason Mm -hmm. and not abuse them. And then when you talk about illegal drugs and you talk about being in Colorado versus Texas right now, I want to say that right now the biblical prescription, and I don't know why I use the word prescription, but uh, the biblical directive is let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. And so, you know, you have some people who are like, well, I'm in Colorado 
Yeah. You know, and you're in Colorado, but if you're in Texas, you're in Texas. And so yeah. I think that's the line. That's a sticky topic. It is. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> it really is in all senses of the word. It is. It is. Because you got, I mean, alcohol at one point in this country, prohibition. It was illegal. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the funny thing about, that's the funny thing about all of this is, there, there's a sense of man's law and God's law, mm -hmm. and there's there's a right and a wrong according to God because our laws change from day to day. Mm -hmm. uh, everything man does changes from day to day, but we know when there's right and we know when there's wrong if we're honest with ourselves. And um, yeah, I just th that's a that's a sticky it, topic. It is. And what's the purpose of that uh, that intake of that specific exactly. substance? Yeah. If it with alcohol, if it's to get drunk to a point where you lose those inhibitions or you lose why you're, you know, why you're sad or you, you're doing it to battle depression, then that's yeah. really scary. Or if there really is a, a medicinal, healthy way to, to use a multitude of different things, mm -hmm. then it can be okay. Yeah. Because some people are struggling with pain and a medicinal way is a good idea. Yeah. Depending on, yeah. Especially uh, something that, is natural out of the earth versus these concoctions made in labs. You know, there's, there's, there's a conversation to be had there, on there that. There is a conversation. Not going to be had right now though. No. We're just going to say that and move yeah. on. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me touch on another drug that a lot of people talk about and we've already uh, mentioned it briefly is coffee. Yeah. And um, I've always presented that it's the Christian form of alcohol. I partake. <laughs> I do too. You know, and when I get together with Christian friends, you know where we go? Story to a books. coffee shop, yeah, <laughs> yeah, to to the mecca of uh, Christian uh, <laughs> coffee. Or if you're if you're lucky enough to have a Christian version of Starbucks, someplace like Holy Grounds or yeah. you know <laughs> Hebrews. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> those are better. There's, yeah, there's Caffeine's a lot of those. More holy. Yeah, um, there's some really good coffee shops here where we are, but. It's just another thing um, that we talked about. It's it becomes a, a vice or a sin when we can't go without it. We can't live without it. Yeah, and that that's a that's a big one. You know, people think caffeine coffee. Oh, don't put that on the list. But that's that's a good point because there's so many that are very dependent on it. And I've seen, I've seen a few that become real bears if they yeah. don't if they don't have it in the mornings. So mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's yeah. kind of like, is it really that important that you yeah. just treated me that way? Yeah. <laughs> It's scary, right? No doubt to yeah. me till I've had my coffee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the people have those cups that go, you don't talk to me until my cup yeah, is exactly. this empty. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. it's, there's always a, a little yeah, truth in every joke in there. <laughs> it, very much so, yeah. Uh, well, let me mention my next one, and it's money. And you say, well, how is that a vice? Well, it's a vice when it starts to control you, when it starts to grip you like that tool. And I'll quote one of the verses that is often misquoted. It says, money is the root of all evil. And a lot of people quote that as if it's scriptural truth, but that's not the way the verse actually reads. Uh, the verse is 1 Timothy 6.10, and it says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. And so the vice is when it becomes greed. Yeah. And Hebrews 13, 5 says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God says, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Going back to Ecclesiastes, uh, Solomon said, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. And then Proverbs 23, 4 and 5 says, do not wear yourself out trying to get rich. Be wise enough to know when to quit. In the blink of an eye, wealth disappears, for it will sprout wings and fly away like an eagle. And so with money, the money is just a tool. It's it's an inanimate object, so it can't necessarily be a vice. But the, the love of it, the envy of it, the greed of it yes. can become that vice. And, and I think, I mean, I dare to say out of all of them that we've mentioned – that quite possibly could be one of the top mm -hmm. vices. Yeah. Because uh, the love of. Yeah. Because I have, I've noticed, you know, something interesting that it's not, you know, people always think, well, it's the billionaires and stuff that like the Bill Gateses and all of that, but it, <laughs> Bill Gateses, <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But I've seen, um, 
especially in, in our line of work, like guys that, that work in the oil field, it's a striving for a status. They mm-hmm. do anything. They work the longest hours, the nastiest job, because they crave to be rich. Mm-hmm. And they get paid a lot there in the oil field. And they, But I've seen this mindset where if people who don't necessarily even have a lot of money, they just they crave it. They mm-hmm. want to be at that level because it means they're a certain person in their mind. And so, yeah, it's the love, the craving of money. Well, and it's interesting how... A lot of these vices become idols, yeah, because it becomes that that idol of mammon where you serve the almighty dollar, yeah, and you ebb and flow based on it. There are people who are happy on the days the stock market is doing well, and there are people who are crushed when it has a, a has a break, it has a fall, yeah. And uh, we saw in, in what was it, 2008, when it crashed, uh, there was a lot of people that committed suicide mm-hmm. that were involved with Wall Street and all yeah. that because it, it was based on that. Yeah, their their worth was based in their worth. And, yeah. and far be it that your worth is ever based out of anything that other than what God says. Yeah. I, I can't help but, but to go ahead and mention this because it's it reminded me of, of one Christmas. You know, we I was in a, at the height of my... Um, my walk with God at that point in my life. I was, I was really close to the Lord and, and God blessed us. One family member gave every family member in the, in, in our family, a a, a nice little check. It wasn't crazy, but it was, it was just like, Oh, thank you, God. That what a blessing, you know? And I remember I hopped on Amazon that night. (laughs) I was like, (laughs) Man, you know, I just, I just gonna treat myself, you know, <laughs> treat yourself, treat mimosas, yourself. Yeah. you know. But uh, I, I got on there and I got, I started looking at it's the stupidest trinkets and and garbage that I was just like, <laughs> man, I'm just gonna treat myself, you know. I swear, after like four days, I was so miserable mm. trying to figure out what I wanted to treat myself with. And I was like, man, I, I don't even want this money. This is stupid. I was happier without it before we got it. Yeah. And, and like I said, it wasn't a, some crazy amount of money, but it was just, it was a blessing. And it was a good little illustration God gave me of this doesn't make you happy. Yeah. Because it never ends. Yes. And and it was just I couldn't help but think of that that one time because I remember I was miserable I was like this and I wasn't really miserable but it, I had the flavor in my I was just like this is dumb. Well, it becomes a pursuit, and yeah. when it does, then you lose sight of pursuing God. Ex- yes. And yeah. so in that you can start to serve the dollar. And so I had um, as a as a sub category of money, I had gambling. And I wanted to just say the Bible doesn't specifically condemn gambling, betting, or even the lottery, but it does caution us against get-rich-quick schemes. And typically, that is what gambling can ultimately tempt people into, the promise of quick riches. And I know two different kinds of people. There are those that see gambling as a form of entertainment. I had one guy say to me that it costs about $100 to take him and his wife out to dinner and then go to a movie, which uh, not anymore because you can't go to the movies right now, (laughs) (laughs) which I just dated this episode because, hey, who knows? (laughs) People might be listening to this a year from now and be like, why can't you go to the movies? Back at the movies. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But it's not an issue for him. Because what he would do is he would go out and he would say, I'm going to spend $200 gambling as my entertainment. And when it's gone, it's gone. And I'm just going to enjoy my time. And if I come out and I actually win a little bit, then I'm going to be happy. And if I lose it all, then... I that was going to be my form of entertainment that evening anyway. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah, and it's not an issue for him. And so then there's the other person who maybe has more of a compulsive and addictive nature and it's not entertainment for them. It becomes that I have to win or I have to do this. And there are so many recorded episodes of people who have even bet their payroll for their employees um, Mm. and, and won at times in order to be able to, to make their, um, their payroll or to make their rent. I, I, it gets scary. Yeah. That's where it gets dangerous. Yeah. And, um, I was reading about some people who are like, well, I want to just win the lottery so I can give it to God. And, (laughs) you know, there's a big caution against that too. Now, if you win the lottery and you want to give some of it to the church, I think that's not necessarily a bad thing, but God doesn't need money that way. And, um, I, I think if you want an interesting study, do um, a research on the lottery curse. 
where a lot of people who win the lottery are actually more miserable and they go through a lot more um, turmoil as they face some of the things that they find. So they didn't realize how fake friends were before yeah. and all of that. It, it opens up a whole new door yeah. that, that they didn't realize even existed. Exactly. It doesn't, it doesn't make you happy. So it becomes sin when the desire to win and greed is overtaking your ability to make rational decisions. That's when it becomes a vice. Oh, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. So that's money. That's money. That's money. Well, the last one I have... And I don't know if this subtitle is accurate or not, but it's kind of something I've seen, and that would be righteous ambitions as a vice. Mm. Um, as I've gotten older, I've I've been more and more surprised to see that even what most would think are righteous aspirations or goals actually become unhealthy vices. Um, I have seen this in ministry, in mission work, raising money for missions, uh, and even outreach for the poor. And there's two ways that I have personally witnessed these type of things become sinful, believe it or not. Um, Number one is pride. And the pride aspect would include um, a very Pharisee-like condition, which, remember, the Pharisee started off with the right idea, being separated for the glory of God. But as we all know, they drifted to that point where they were separated for the glory of themselves. And that's where it starts to make that ugly turn into a vice, into a strange fire, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, Anyway, I've unfortunately seen this um, where even ministries become competitive. It's about the numbers. Um, The spotlight falls on the most notable righteous acts or most money donated or most talented public speaker. And when ministry starts to fall into those type of categories, the ship has been sailing off course for a while. And I have seen, like, the you should never be competitive. Paul goes over that in, in 1 Corinthians, where I'm of Paul, I'm of Paulos. And it becomes a competition, and that is not what ministry is about. Um, it, when it starts to fall into the, those categories, it becomes it becomes not righteous anymore. And, and I've seen, you know, I come, Josh and I both come from, from ministry background families. Uh, he was a preacher's kid. I, I came from a missionary family. And... Um, it's just, it shouldn't be that way. And I'm reminded of Revelation 2, 4 through 5, where it says, But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen. Repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. So the root of, of competitiveness, numbers, the spotlight, all those things, they come from pride. And James three sixteen through 17 tells us, For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy, and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. And if we're walking in the Spirit and clinging to humility, then God will naturally raise us up for His glory. But if we try to raise ourselves up for our glory, eventually God will humble us. And um, that's one way that that striving for the kingdom of God Mm -hmm. can become a vice. And I, that's uh, that's a very dangerous one. I'm sure, Josh, you've you could probably weigh in on on several yeah. points there, um, if you want to. And I've got a, a second portion of this too. Yeah, I think for me, it's just really heartbreaking when you set out to do something that's for God, and then unbeknownst to the person, it becomes a work of the flesh. Yeah, and you don't even realize that this paradigm shift has happened. But you're just pushing on. And a lot of times when you have your head to the plow, in a sense, you're not necessarily looking up at times going, let me take stock of my own individual life. And why am I doing this? Am I still doing it for God or am I doing it for me? And that yeah. that is easy to happen, that that shift um it just and it's hard sometimes to pinpoint where it started mm-hmm. because you look back and you're like, when did this happen? Yeah, I because you know you remember the the starting point. It yeah. was it was great, and so it's something you got to keep an eye on mm-hmm. and continue to to go back to what your priorities are and what your passion is and why you're doing what you're doing and and if you find that somehow you straight off course, then it does take humility and it does take. Uh, a strong sense of um, laying down your pride to go. I messed up. I yeah. somewhere I lost the plot. And it and it's hard to make those type of admissions, but uh, you're you're never gonna be able to to wiggle your way back into right without 
saying, hey, this has to change mm-hmm. and to re-surrender to God and get let him get you back on track. Yeah. I, I've heard, you know, sometimes people say you have to crawl back to right. No, that's not how it works. You have to surrender to God and let him do um, a, the work in you that he did at first. Yeah. And sometimes it's even a public thing where it's like, yes, I, I screwed up, <laughs> you yeah. know, I think uh, what was our episode on uh, confrontation? Mm-hmm. We address some of that. Yeah. Sometimes it has to be a public thing. And we're men, we're men and we're, we're men and women, we're human and we screw up, you know, and yeah. we don't like admitting it, but it's out there, you know, and we're all sinful. We have a sinful nature. Yes. So that's that's one way. And another another aspect that I saw was um, a neglect of priorities. We mm. kind of leads into that. We were just talking about priorities. Um, but I believe that any one of us at any point are in danger of falling into pride. Uh, the second category I have seen, uh, it's a deeper condition. The best way I can describe it is with a true story from a, a friend of mine who gave me permission to share it without his name. But um, I have a good friend whose whose father is a Christian with he was very strong convictions, and he served the Lord for a very long time his whole life. And for most of my buddy's life, uh, his dad had been so dedicated to serving God and raising money for missions, and uh, he rarely had time for family. He, he was so focused on ministry, and unfortunately, um, when interactions were had with, with family, they were through the lens of falling short of what God expected of them and how they looked to the church and all of those things. And um, he, he was pretty hard on him as he grew up. Uh, he never felt like he he could do anything right, and their relationship, uh, he said, was very distant and very shallow for most of his life. And he told me that one day uh, there was a point much later in life where his dad had sent him a letter with an apology and his dad told him that he was sorry he had neglected him for so many years and that work had always taken priority over relationship. And he was ecstatic because he said that his, he finally thought he was going to have this moment of closure. And, um, but, but shortly after the apology in the letter, uh, his dad said that he had done all those things because he was working for God. And the letter ended with a flavor of justification oh, and wow. exemption. And um, it, it was heartbreaking because the justification was unjust. The relationship continued to decay and closure was never had. And the tragic part of the story is the fact that the father was righteous in his actions of neglect to the first priority of someone who has chosen to have a family. Mm. Um, did he really love God? I think probably so. Did he really want to make um, a difference for the kingdom? I think he, he did want to do that. But he failed to recognize that we are all working for God. And no amount of money donated or time served places us as more righteous than the next believer. And um, if that was the case, the road to heaven is a competition. Mm-hmm. That's what it is, if that's the case. And and that's not the case. Jesus' whole struggle with the Pharisees was this very thing. Uh, Matthew twenty three twenty three. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You pay tithes of mint, dill, and cumin, but you have disregarded the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, uh, you strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. We mm-hmm. all know that verse. But, you know, Paul, he points out in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 that if you're called to a fully devoted and intense desire for ministry, then you're going to be better off single. Mm-hmm. Um, but Because a family man is obligated to dedicate the proper time in raising that family correctly. And when that is neglected... Um, then the things that arise are strife, confusion, resentment. And the most tragic result in so many of those cases is it'll drive them from the very God that is supposed to be represented through the leader of that family mm-hmm. um, for those the, that, that selfish ambition to, to do something um, and neglect something that you're, you're called to first. Yeah. So with all that being said... Um, if that's someone out there, if you you see that in yourself, that you you justify neglecting that type of thing for what you see as a righteous cause, it's a good calling that you have. But if you have a family, then make sure you're tending to the closest flock before reaching for the world, because it makes bigger waves through the next generation than your legacy could ever make. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes the quiet, thoughtful, and spirit-filled moments with your family are more valuable than a million dollars donated overseas. Yes. 
So that's that's something that I it's it's one story that's just really stuck with me and yeah. uh, a tragic one that I think uh, we just talked about with money clinging to money. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it drives the same type of mindset that the drive for for that kind of thing. Yeah, God doesn't call super Christians. You know, there's not any ministry priority where that would supersede your family. Yeah. You know, you're a father before you're a pastor ever yeah. in in the hierarchy of the way that God has established it. It's your, you know, he's first, then your wife and then your family and then even then you have to provide and in a lot of ways and then ministry falls after that. Yeah. And so and, and when when an unbelieving world is going to come to Christ, they're going to do it by seeing how you act mm-hmm. in, in all of those situations. Yeah. Not necessarily because of what you did in ministry. Yeah. So it reminded me of the book of Haggai, which is all about priorities. And they talk about how um, they're like, we harvest, but nothing happens. We don't gain any movement, any traction forward. It's like we're putting our seeds into our pockets to save them for next season, but our pockets have holes in them. Mm -hmm. And God said it's because you're not prioritizing the right thing at the right place. And so it just that. That's really hard to hear because I bet he was so excited to read that letter and tell that last little bit of justification. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, but it was worth it. I'm sorry, but. Yeah. Which is, I mean, I'm sure there's some wisdom in there is that anytime you say a but in your apology, you don't really mean it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I said I was on my last one. I had one more. It was, uh, it's <laughs> anger. Sneak. You're yeah. sneaky. <laughs> well, I had like, I don't know. I wrote down a bunch. Like That makes me angry. <laughs> I see what you did there. Okay, um, so angry. Can you be angry and not sin? Can it not become a vice? If you're flipping tables, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, you're going. You're going the right direction. Um, because some people really struggle with anger, and I think it's something that we can identify a lot um, as we look at like what are the sins that I typically struggle with. I mean, anger for me might land as one of my top five or top ten. Because, you know, all of a sudden you're just like, I'm so mad, yeah. <laughs> you know, Hulk levels of mad. But the Bible in Ephesians 4, uh, 26 and 27 says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. And that quote is actually coming from Psalm 4, 4, which says, um, be angry, but do not sin yeah. and meditate on the Lord day and night. And so I just found um, that there's actually a version of righteous anger that we can have. And it's exemplified by Jesus where he saw the money changes in the temple and he started flipping tables and he started to drive them out. And of course he was saying, this is my father's house. And he made a whip out of cords and um, he was upset and it was, it was right. It was righteous. You know, and, and of course he wasn't going around and I've said this a few times, but he wasn't going around like kicking over the bird cages. He wasn't going over and whipping the animals when he would get to them. He'd be like, you're free, you're free, you know, and uh, he, he was very just angry with the system and, and, um, righteous anger is roused by evil that profanes God's holiness and perverts his goodness. And what's interesting is that we care more about God's reputation than our own. And that's where we can have righteous anger. And then righteous anger also first sees the logs in our own eyes and it gets upset and grieved um, by our own perversion of God's goodness. And um, it causes us to repent before we ever call somebody out on their own uh, splinter in their eye. Another thing is righteous anger is grieved, not merely infuriated by evil. And Jesus did this as he flipped the tables in the temple, but he was also deeply grieved over the sin that made it necessary. Anger with no tears over evil is often an evidence of lack of love in us. Mm. Righteous anger is governed by God's love and therefore slow to be expressed. It's not that explosive like, oh, you know, because (laughs) that's usually how um, sinful anger is more expressed is like just that ticking time bomb kind of um, anger. So uh, it's slow to be expressed. It allows redemptive acts of love to be pursued at first, if at all possible. And then um, righteous anger also acts swiftly when necessary. And the way that I would say that is um, 
some forms of evil require us to be quick to speak and quick to act. Uh, maybe you see somebody who's participating in sex trafficking or human slavery or adultery, or um, they're beating somebody up on the street. Righteous anger, if we keep our anger in check, would allow us to intervene to yeah. somehow come to that person's aid. And so yeah. there is that point where you can say, hey, I was angry, but it was in the right spirit. Yeah. Typically, that vice, that line becomes sin when we allow it to become fleshly and when we allow it to have some form of selfishness to where it's like, well, I'm mad because it affected me this way. Yeah. And I think of, of the way it's described in one of those scary lists that we read about those who don't go to, you know, aren't going to the kingdom of yeah. heaven, of the, the fits of rage or fits of anger. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's like an outburst. A, it's like, wrath. yeah, an outburst. It, it's like a temper tantrum, uncontrollable. Yeah. Or the guy who often looks at his brother and calls him Raka, you know, he's always upset. Yeah. And he goes, you're, you're a bonehead and, and yeah. you're empty headed is what Raka translates to. Yeah. So I had laziness, which you covered really well with gluttony because I was even um, quoting some of the same verses from Proverbs. And then I also had just entertainment. I think entertainment becomes a vice when we lean way too much into it. You know, and you also covered that, I think, with gluttony, where it's like, um, where do, where is the line? Um, is it like I can enjoy it and I can watch it and feel like I filled an hour of my time or a couple hours of my time? Or is it like I have to have this and if I don't have it, then I don't have a part of me? Yeah. So. Yeah, it's all it's always about that discernment of, of, of where it might possibly turn. Yes. And it comes back to the conscience again. Yes. Yeah. You know, I was thinking um, there's that that saying that goes, you know, everything in moderation except Jesus, <laughs> you know, yeah. and I don't know if that's a good way to approach some of these topics, but I think for a lot of them, it's like, hey, um, I don't ever want to cross the line with any of them. I don't yeah. want them to become sin. I don't want to be caught in a vice yes. um, because it's happened before and it it's a scary place. And the rule is always um, clear conscience checks against God's word. But there's, like Josh said earlier, there's some things the Bible doesn't directly address. And so we have to be walking in the spirit to discern that stuff correctly. And um, th that's between you and God, but be honest. Um, and and if, you need, if you need help getting back to right, um, I know it's scary to admit it sometimes, but, but do it. Make that step. Ask mm -hmm. God, God, I need help. I yeah. can't do this on my yeah. own. And find an accountability partner. Yes. Uh, somebody that you can talk to about it and reach out. You know, you don't have to put that out there on Facebook or yeah. Instagram or any social media site. But if you're feeling comfortable enough, please send us a message and we will pray for you or we will offer you whatever help that we can. Because yeah. there are ways to get out of the web of sin. Because, like Stephen said at the very beginning of this, if we get caught in that web and it goes all the way from conception to, to being fully alive, the end of the result is death. Yeah. And that, that's, a, that's a scary thing to, to think that you've allowed yourself to do that instead of just turning to God and allow Him to do what we can't. Mm -hmm. So don't be afraid to take that step. Yeah. So that is, when does it become sin? And <laughs> you you got to choose. <laughs> you got to choose for yourself. Because yeah. we, we only know our own hearts. We, yeah. we don't know our brother's heart. And I'm so thankful for that verse in Romans where it's like, it, let that be between him and God. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And just want to be cautious of one another. You know, don't cause your brother to stumble through a liberty that you have. You yeah, know? that's true. So. In those in those times, it's okay to keep that secret between you and God. Yes, exactly. And uh, we're thankful that you joined us today. Uh, we do want to hear from you. If uh, you want to contact us about anything, our lines of communication are open, either uh, through direct message on Facebook or you can email us at connect at bsnakebird.com. We want to have you join the conversation. Tell us what you thought. Tell us if we missed any vices and uh, tell us what we can pray for you in. Yeah. And um, as we always say, guys, if this has benefited you, um, share us on on Facebook or what, whatever your social media platform is and 
the, the number one way that it would really help us out is if you could give us a, a good rating or review on whatever you listen on. And it's not about numbers. It's never about numbers. It's about the gospel. So that would help the Snakebird podcast. A to the men. All right, Snakebirds, always remember, whatever you do, wherever you go, no matter what life throws at you, there's never been a better time to follow the words of Jesus. And be a a Snakebird. So you can be on the dangers of fire of hell for saying you're dumb. <laughs> that, I think you've said that's an untranslatable word or something. Yeah. That's always confused me because I'm oh, like, yeah. is that it? Because I've uh, I've said that to people. Did that mean I'm going to hell? <laughs> no, I. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. No, I think we need to go back and study it. It's another snake bird topic. Yeah. It, no, probably I don't know. There's probably a deeper meaning, a very deep uh, heart heart yes. condition. I think it's if you constantly view your brother as empty headed and you have no uh, redemptive love in your heart, then that's where you yeah. get into. So it's more than just bonehead. Yes. It's, it's a, it's a heart of heart check territory. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Yeah.